I and Jason Vickers have brought forth a, a new volume of John Wesley's sermons, a new collection, um, and I wanted to provide some background as to why we brought forth uh, this material at this time. As you probably realize, John Wesley produced uh, quite a few number of sermons. Um, not all sermons were preached. Some sermons were used as teaching mechanisms. Uh, Wesley wanted to communicate the genius of the Christian faith uh, by means of these materials, uh, sermons. Um, Wesley published a number of early sermons from the period of 1725 to 1737, some of which uh, he did not bring into publication, and we call these uh, manuscript sermons, manuscript sermons. Uh, the first collection, the first printed collection that Wesley brought forward uh, emerged in 1746. And then there were other collections uh, two years after that, 1748, uh, 1750, and a 1760 collection as well. Uh, the 1760 collection is rather interesting because it contained 43 sermons uh, and then the sermons Wandering Thoughts was added to it uh, to bring the total to 44. Uh, this is the familiar 44 sermons that uh, people talk about from time to time uh, and certainly uh, in Britain uh, these sermons, this particular collection uh, is very well known. Uh, Wesley writes at the outset of his sermon collection, uh, what is the purpose? What is, what is the purpose of this body of literature? And he writes this, quote, I have accordingly set down in the following sermons what I find in the Bible concerning the way to heaven with a view to distinguish the way of God from all those which are the inventions of men. Uh, in another place, uh, Wesley writes that he seeks to teach the essentials of true religion by means of this body of literature. Now, in order to bring some regularity and some control uh, to what was preached in Methodist pulpits in the 18th century, Wesley executed what is called a model deed uh, in 1763. Uh, let me read from this deed and you'll get a feel for what Wesley was trying to do by means of this instrument. Quote, provided always that no person or person whomsoever shall any time hereafter be permitted to preach or expound God's holy word or perform any of the unusual acts of religious worship in the said chapel, who shall maintain, promulgate, or teach any doctrine or practice contrary to what is contained in certain notes on the New Testament and in the first four volumes of sermons commonly reputed to be written and published by him. And so, how many sermons existed uh, at this time when this model deed was promulgated in 1763? Well, if we look at the 1760 collection of sermons, as you'll recall, they contained 44 pieces. Um, in 1771, Wesley brought forth another edition of sermons, uh, and he added uh, to the number from 1760. He added nine more, uh, such things as the witness of the Spirit, Discourse 2, on sin and believers, the repentance of believers. These two last sermons are so important for understanding the Wesleyan order of salvation. The Great Assize, uh, the Lord our Righteousness, the Scripture Way of Salvation, which is a wonderful sermon. It basically summarizes, epitomizes uh, Wesley's doctrine of salvation the good steward, the reformation of manners, and then finally, on the death of George Whitfield. These nine additional sermons emerged uh, in 1771. Then, interestingly enough, in 1787, 1788, late in Wesley's career, he brought forth uh, another edition of sermons, and this edition was identical with the volumes already published in 1746, 
1750, and 1760. Uh, it included the sermon, of course, Wandering Thoughts, and so the number here uh, in the 1787 edition of Wesley's sermons was 44 uh, and not, and did not include the additional nine, uh, which would have made it uh, 53 if we uh, include the one on George Whitfield. And so some have speculated why did Wesley, in a sense, drop back uh, to uh, the 44 sermons, and there's been a whole discussion about that uh, in terms of Wesley's uh, 1787 edition. Um, if we look at what was published in 1771 that included those nine new sermons, Albert Outler, uh, his judgment was that the omission of these eight sermons, that is, if we exclude the one on George Whitfield, uh, would represent, quote, a serious loss, especially since it would shunt aside the two landmark sermons, the Scripture Way of Salvation and the Lord Our Righteousness. Okay. Uh, and so there has been a publishing history in terms of Wesley's sermons. The British have tended to publish the 44 sermons, which are related to the model deed of 1763. But there were other collections of sermons that emerged uh, later on and in other areas. Uh, for example, uh, the Canadian Nathaniel uh, Burwash uh, came forward with John Wesley's 52 standard sermons, that, that volume. Uh, and I suppose Burwash was looking at the publishing history of 1771 and what, what Wesley had done in that year. And then the Australian Edward Sugden uh, came out with a two-volume, uh, the Standard Sermons of John Wesley, that embraced uh, 53 sermons, although uh, he placed the nine additional sermons uh, of the 1771 edition uh, apart, uh, apart from the 44. And so there are two major sections uh, in, in Sugden's work, and indeed the Australians, by and large, were reading uh, 44 sermons, though uh, Sugden did indeed publish 53. Then there is the work of W.P. Harrison, uh, Methodist, uh, American Methodist, in his Wesleyan Standards, Volume 1 and 2. Uh, this was published in 1921, and this focused on 52 sermons. And then most recently, uh, there is the work of Outler and Heitzenrader, John Wesley's Sermons and Anthology, and that contains 50 sermons uh, in the collection, and that was published in 1991. The Outler Heitzenrader anthology is, of course, uh, an important volume, and it has served the church well, uh, especially in terms of tracking Wesley's own growth uh, and development over time. Why then did I and Jason Vickers bring forward uh, a new collection? Well, we have used the Outler Heights and Raider volume in the past, uh, and in my judgment, I'll just speak for myself at this point, uh, the arrangement and composition of the John Wesley's sermons and anthology, uh, they are not best suited for use in active, full-orb Christian discipleship. Uh, why do I say that? I say that because the sermons in the Outler Heitzenrader uh, volume are arranged chronologically. Uh, the sermons are ordered to track the development, Wesley's development, John Wesley's development over time. And you can clearly see that. Uh, it seems then uh, to be well suited to a graduate uh, seminar that is focused on Wesley in terms of his historical and theological development, uh, but it is not focused uh, on the scripture way of salvation, so to speak. And so our volume that we're bringing forth now is arranged uh, theologically, soteriologically, in terms of the order of salvation, and it has a focus on Christian formation. Now, we can compare the Outler Heitzenrader anthology to something like the Burwash edition of Wesley's sermons, uh, that is John Wesley's 52 standard sermons. That was the title 
of Burwash's edition. And um, interestingly enough, the Outler Heights and Rader collection includes seven of the nine additional sermons uh, from the 1771 edition of Wesley's sermons. Uh, the ones on Whitfield and the Reformation of Manners are deleted. And so when we look at the Outler Heights and Rader volume, the, its major difference from other collections are due in large part uh, to what sermons of the 44 are left out. Uh, and so the Outler Heights and Rader volume excludes many of the 44 sermons that Wesley himself viewed quite favorably as representing the substance of what he was preaching. These same 44 sermons were in fact protected by the model deed of 1763 and were subsequently given formal status in British Methodism. These sermons have had a rich publishing history as a distinct and valu valuable body of literature through the work of Burwash and also Harrison and we might also say Sugden. Um, these sermons have been and remain uh, so integral to Christian formation and substantive catechesis. Um, now, let's just take a look at, do this specifically, what sermons the Outler Heights and Rader volume leave out. I'm going to break it down into three major categories. First, they leave out sermons in terms of faith and assurance. Specifically, the sermon, The Righteousness of Faith, The First Fruits of the Spirit, The Witness of Our Own Spirit, and The Nature of Enthusiasm. In, in other words, these four sermons, which have to do with faith, and assurance, which are so important uh, to understanding serious Christian formation, uh, are left out. Secondly, uh, a number of sermons that have to do with Wesley's uh, theological ethics, and I'm thinking here of the Sermon on the Mount series, which is one of the best windows on Wesley's theological ethics. A number of these sermons are left out. Um, the Sermon on the Mount Discourse 1, uh, Discourse 2, Discourse 3, Discourse 7, Discourse 9, uh, 10, 11, 12, and 13 are all shunted aside. Um, the third major category of omission in terms of the Outler Heights and Rate of Volume uh, has to do with challenges to the Christian life. And indeed, this is an issue that has come up again and again uh, with professors teaching in classrooms, with students, that the current anthology does not treat the darker sides, the more troubling, the more problematic, problematic the more difficult uh, sides of the Christian life. And so this third section is named Challenges to the Christian Life. What sermons are we thinking of here that are left out in the Outler Heights and Raider anthology? Wandering Thoughts, uh, Satan's Devices, The Wilderness State, Heaviness Through Manifold Temptations, Self-Denial, and The Cure of Evil Speaking. Okay. And so um, we need a collection that is focused on serious Christian formation that will present a realistic and accurate picture of what the challenges are uh, to, in the Christian journey. Now, when we look at the literature of the 52 or 53 standard sermons, if you include uh, the one by George Whitfield, um, these collections are not adequate for today. Uh, they must be supplemented. Uh, and so uh, we have brought forth eight additional sermons beyond the 52. Uh, such things as the general deliverance, which shows that redemption does not simply focus on human beings, but embraces the animal realm as well. Uh, the new creation uh, on working out our own salvation. The Danger of Riches, The Importance of Wesley's Theological Economics on Visiting the Sick, a wonderful sermon that carefully balances temporal and spiritual ministries. The Duty of Constant Communion, showing 
uh, the importance that Wesley attached to the sacraments, free grace, and then also the image of God. And so this new collection of sermons, it builds on the past uh, and adds to it. And so it constitutes what we're calling a living tradition. Uh, it touch, touches base with the British 44 sermons. Uh, it also touches base with those eight additional from the North American, Canadian, and Australian 52. And then to that, it adds eight more to bring the total uh, to 60. This collection is also valuable in that it is not arranged chronologically, but it is arranged soteriologically in terms of the order of salvation. The collection begins with creation, the image of God, then the fall, uh, free grace, repentance, and every step along the way until we get to the new creation. On some level, uh, it almost reads like a novel, and you're wondering how this person will do in the journey. Um, and so the sermons are arranged in that fashion. The order is reflected in a number of theological categories, and those theological categories are listed in the table of contents. The goodness of creation, the fall, free grace, awakening, provenient grace and repentance, provenient grace and converting grace, repentance, justification, justification and imputation, regeneration or the new birth, assurance, the Christian life, challenges to the Christian life, the sum of true religion, illumination and second repentance, second repentance, pressing on to Christian perfection, Christian perfection, the extent of redemption, judgment and glorifying grace, and then finally glorifying grace in the new creation. We should also point out that the text used in this new collection of sermons represents the best scholarship. Uh, it is drawn from the bicentennial edition of Wesley's works, the critical edition that Albert Outler so carefully put together uh, in the four uh, volumes of sermons. Outler's notes, however, have been removed for the sake of space, although all of Wesley's original notes uh, have been retained. Um, as readers pick up this volume and look at the brief introductions which precede uh, each one of the sermons, and then that brief introduction is also followed by an outline, a one-page outline, so you can see the entirety of the sermon at a glance, there is um, special formatting on the introduction pages so readers can understand right away where they are and from what body, what collection, this particular sermon has been drawn. Uh, if there's no special formatting, then it's drawn from the historic 44 sermons that received Wesley's approval uh, in the model deed and that was later affirmed by British Methodism. Uh, if a sermon title is italicized, then it represents those eight more, uh, which were published in 1771, if we exclude the one on George Whitfield, and that were republished by Burwash, Harrison, and Sugden. And then finally, uh, if the sermon title is underlined, then that means it refers to one of those eight quote, quote, new sermons uh, that fills out the collection for contemporary interest. Our hope is that this new volume of sermons will pass on the genius of Wesleyanism uh, in diverse corners of the world. Indeed, uh, we have been in conversation with lay people, pastors, and scholars in the global community uh, and asked them what sermons should be a part of this collection. We hope this anthology will be the means by which the genius of Wesleyanism will be communicated to the uh, upcoming generation, those who are especially earnest uh, to be conformed to the glorious image of Jesus Christ.